Now would be a good time, if before we get too much further into the program, that if you haven't shut off your cell phones or put them on vibrate or beepers, etc., now would be a great time to do that. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to invite out now Rabbi Lawrence Rosenthal for a Devar Torah, a piece of Torah some learning from Thank you.
France, Germany, Israel, and the United States for his courage and his conscience. Students learn from him that there are idealistic, honest, dedicated public servants who commit their lives to doing the right thing and, as importantly, getting others to do the right thing. Just last March on this stage, Bema, or Bema stage, Tova Felshu Broadway actress sang. A whole production for Stu it was one of the greatest things we've had here. And Stu, was as cool as could be, he sat in the third row, was tossing a basketball. So please join me in saluting and thanking our Grady High School Titan, Ambassador Stuart Eisenstein. This lecture is now sadly renamed to honor Fran Eisenstadt, my life's partner and wonderful wife of 45 years, who exemplified the best in Jewish and American values, who made Atlanta and the A synagogue her home when we moved here, and who never lost her connection to my family and to the score of friends that she made here. Fran made an indelible mark through her contributions to the Jewish community of Atlanta, from her vice presidency of the National Council of Jewish Women, where she pioneered a special TASAC screening program, which was then taken nationally, and has saved thousands of families from heartache and tragedy, and was the founding chair, along with me, of the Institute of Adult Jewish Education. She also enriched the general community, working for the Model Cities program, being selected to leadership in Atlanta, and then playing an absolutely pivotal role in the election of Andy Young as the first African-American congressman from the Deep South since Reconstruction. This lecture series also honors my late father and mother, Leo and Sylvia, Eisenstadt and my uncle Barry and Aunt Bessie, all of whom were lifelong members of the AA. Tom Friedman does great honor to the memory of my family by speaking to us tonight. Without any fear of exaggeration, I can say that Tom Friedman is the single most influential person of our era in the area of ideas and public affairs in explaining a complicated and dangerous world to all of us. In a recent meeting of the Defense Policy Board, on which I served, devoted for two days to ISIS, in the midst of the discussion, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff cited Tom's recent article for all of us as helping us understand how to deal with ISIS. He's been called as well the most cited thinker and business conversations. And I know of no other person who has ever won three Pulitzer Prizes for writing other than Tom Friedman. His range of coverage through his twice weekly New York Times columns of 840 words, by the way, almost all of which are reviewed by his wife, Anne, <laughs> his best selling books, his documentaries, and his speeches to forums all over the world cover an astounding range of topics. Islamic terrorism, the direction of the Arab world, the Middle East peace process, climate change and the environment, the technology revolution, Asia and the rise of China, our own conventional energy revolution in the United States and its economic and geopolitical impacts, globalization, America's standing in the world, the American and global economy. He's earned the confidence of heads of state, as shown by his lengthy recent personal interview with President Obama. And he is as comfortable as talking with leaders from all over the world as he is with our own 
elected officials. It was in his discussion in 2002 with the then Saudi Prince Abdullah, now the king, in which Tom strongly recommended and he followed the advice to lay out what is now known as the Saudi Peace Plan with eventual normalization with Israel. There are many distinctive themes about Tom's writing. He doesn't simply report events, he analyzes them in ways that senior government and corporate decision makers and all of us can understand and act on. He doesn't simply wake up and from a mountaintop give us ideas. He rolls up his sleeves and goes on assignment all over the world talking to CEOs of major corporations in the U.S., India, and China, to heads of state, to entrepreneurs and innovators, and to common people on the ground, from rural villages to royal palaces. He's introduced a whole new language. His book, The World is Flat, became required reading for everyone trying to understand our new globalized, interconnected world. And this has now passed into our lexicon as a way of describing our brave new world. He has a sense of trends that allow all of us to look ahead, as Rabbi Rosenthal said, not down but up. We don't have to agree with every one of his columns to agree that he makes all of us think about things in ways we would not otherwise do. Now the fact is, if Tom had his brothers, he might have preferred to become a professional golfer because his father often took him to the golf course in suburban Minneapolis. He was a caddy at that golf course. And for the great professional golfer, Chichi Rodriguez, when he played at the U.S. Open there. We can all be thankful he chose not to pursue a golf career, and I'm sure Tiger Woods must be breathing a sigh of relief as well. He's joked that the golf course is the only place where Quote, I can go and no one stops me and asks me what you think about the latest Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. <laughs> Judaism and the love of Israel were formative parts of Tom's early life. He attended Hebrew school, belonged to a synagogue in suburban Minneapolis, Adat Yerushon, whose rabbi was Arnold Gooden, later the longtime beloved rabbi of the A.A. synagogue. And by the way, that same suburban Minneapolis synagogue was also the one in which our rabbi now, Neil Sandler, grew up. Tom went to a Zionist summer camp in Wisconsin, spent his summer high school years living on a kibbutz near Haifa, made his first of innumerable trips to Israel with his parents to visit his older sister who was studying at Tel Aviv University. He recalled his high school years as one big celebration of Israel's victory in the Six-Day War. He graduated from France alma mater, Brandeis, summa cum laude, slightly higher grades than Fran got, and then Oxford. There have been several phases of Tom's storied career. First was his Middle East phase, beginning in 1982 as the bureau chief of the New York Times in Beirut, Lebanon. He was there during the Israeli-Lebanese War, the tragedies at Sabra and Shatila refugee camps, the suicide bombings by Israeli radicals of the American Embassy and the Marine headquarters. He has said that, and I quote, the biggest survival mechanism, being a Jewish New York Times correspondent in the Arab world, is listening as a sign of respect. He won his first Pulitzer Prize for his reporting from Beirut. Almost uniquely, he was moved from Beirut to Jerusalem in 1984, serving as the New York Times correspondent in Israel. And there he earned his second Pulitzer Prize for international reporting, and in his spare time, wrote the classic book from Beirut to Jerusalem, earning him the U.S. National Book Award. The second phase of Tom's career was in Washington becoming the Times State Department and White House correspondent and beginning his twice-weekly op-ed articles. 
which gained him an international audience and the third Pulitzer Prize for distinguished commentary. The third phase is as the author of books that have sold an almost unprecedented numbers. The World is Flat was literally on the New York Times bestseller list for two full years. It sold over two and a half million books. He hosts several documentaries for the Discovery Channel and is a regular on television and major forums. Since 9-11, his writings have increasingly focused on the threat of Islamic terrorism. Tom's received the Overseas Press Award for Lifetime Achievement and was named to the Order of the British Empire by Queen Elizabeth. More broadly, what Tom has taught us is that even in a digital age, the power of words and ideas still matter. One only had to pick up today's New York Times and read, not the world is flat, but the world is fast about globalization, the increasing speed of microchips, and the rapid growth of carbon in our atmosphere. And yet with all of this, Tom is a terrific human being who's never forgotten his Jewish roots. When we talked about what he might speak on this evening, we felt that perhaps he could all help all of us make sense of a troubled and turbulent world. There'll be a book signing afterward where you'll have a chance to, to meet Tom and, and purchase some of his books. Tom, from uh, the bottom of our hearts, from the eyes of that family, and I think from this remarkable turnout, we thank you very much for coming, and you honor us by your attendance, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Said, do you remember who caddy for you at the 1970 U.S. Open at Hazleton? And without missing a beat, he said, Tommy. And as family friends will do, they said to him, do you know he's more famous than you are today? <laughs> Chi Chi thought about that for a second and said, not in Puerto Rico. <laughs> to be an effective columnist, you, you really need uh, two things in particular. You, you need to be coming from somewhere. You need to be leaning into the world from a particular direction. And I lean into the world from having grown up in Minnesota uh, at a time and place when politics were. And that endowed me with something very dangerous, and that is an optimism bias, um, which occasionally gets me in trouble, but um, that is where it comes from. But I think to be an effective columnist, you also have to be going somewhere. You always have to be carrying around a working hypothesis of what's going on in the world. What are the biggest trends shaping things today? Um, and that's really what I'm going to share with you tonight. At times I've called it Lexus Naltry. At times I've called it the world is flat. Now I call it the world is fast. But it's really a brief theory of everything. It's a brief theory of what I think are the biggest forces shaping politics, economics, education uh, in the world today. 
Now, when I think about where America is at right now, I'm often reminded of uh, that 1950s film, uh, Great Orson Welles classic, Touch of Evil. Um, it was a movie about, uh, as you recall, murder, kidnapping, conspiracy, and corruption in a town on the Mexican-American border. Orson Welles plays a crooked cop who tries to frame his Mexican counterpart for a murder. At one point, Welles stumbles into a brothel and finds the proprietor there, Marlene Peter, who is also a fortune teller with cards spread out in front of him. Read my future for me, Wells says. You have been proud of me, Mr. Wells. Your future is all used up. Your future is all used up. Is that us? Is that America? Is our future all used up? I don't think so. If you read my column, I sure don't think so. I remain an optimist about America, but I am a frustrated optimist. Frustrated that at the national level we would have been frustrated in our ability to do the things we needed to continue to pass on the American dream to another generation. What I want to talk about tonight are really what is the world in which we have to operate. What are the things we have to do in order to thrive? So I'll just be an optimist, not a frustrated optimist. Now, when future historians look back at this period, early 21st century, um, late uh, 1990s, and ask the question, what was the most important thing happening at this time? What will they say? Will they say it was 9-11? Will they say it was the subprime crisis? The dot-com boom or bust? Will they say it was the breakup of Brad and Jen, or the marriage of William and Kate? What, what, what will they say? Well, I think what they will say is the biggest thing happening in the early 21st century was that the three biggest forces on the planet, which I call the market, that's globalization, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, theorem that the steam powered microchips will double every 24 months. That all three of these giant forces entered the second half of the chessboard. Now, what do I mean by that? I read a very important book last year, it had a big influence on me, written by two friends of mine, Eric Richardson and Andy McAfee, uh, professors at MIT, called Second Machine Age. And in their book, they basically argue that the first machine age, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, was built around the steam engine. The steam engine doubled in power every 70 years. With the steam engine, human labor was always required to be a complement to direct the machines. Their argument is that the second machine age is built around the microchip, which now under Moore's law, doubles every 24 months in power. And as a result, human direction is increasingly less needed, and machines and software are becoming substitutes for human labor, not companies. And in their book, they use, can you turn down the sound just a little bit? Who's ever on the mic? Thank you. The image they use in the book, pardon me. Can't hear me? Turn it up, I told you. <laughs> and the image they use, I'm sorry. The image they use in their book is uh, well known imaging technology. Uh, it's a story about the man who invented chess. And he gave the game to the Persian king. King loved it so much, said, How can I reward you? man said, well, all I'd really like is to be able to feed my family. The king said, it shall be done. What would you like? He said, I'd just like you to take one kernel of rice or hymns, put it on the first square of the chessboard, put two on the second, four on the next, eight on the next, six on the next, and just keep doubling it, and all the family will be fine. The king said, of course, it shall be done, not realizing that when you double something 63 times, the number you get is 18 quintillion, okay. <laughs> which was more rice than existed in the whole world. <laughs> Now, they use that image in their book to talk about what happens when Moore's Law, when the power of microchips keeps doubling, and you get into the second half of the chessboard, 
where the doubling starts to get very, very big. And the argument of their book is, when it comes to Moore's Law, we just entered the second half of the chessboard. And you start to see some really funky things. You start to see computers that can beat the world's chess champion. You start to see computers that can win a Jeopardy. I was at Cleveland Clinic yesterday. They've got Watson, the IBM computer down there, basically teaching medical courses now uh, because it's more or less scarfed up all the medical knowledge in the history of the world. As they point out in their book, in fact, I'm 61, I grew up with the Jetsons. I know some of you I can see look like my contemporaries out there. George Jetson, you'll remember, drove his own flying saucer. That is, the creators of the Jetsons couldn't imagine what we have right now, which is a Google self-driving car. So the argument of their book is that when it comes to Moore's Law and all these new technologies, you ain't seen nothing because we just entered the second half of the chessboard when the doubling starts to get really big. Now the argument that I built on that is that not only do I agree with that, but I think what's even more interesting and impactful is that we have also entered the second half of the chessboard, not just with Moore's Law, but with the market, that's globalization, and Mother Nature at the same time. Now the market for me, as I say, is globalization. And I believe that's happened over the last 50 years, disguised a little by the subprime crisis of post 9-11, is that the world has basically gone from connected to hyper-connected, and from interconnected to interdependent. And these are differences of degree that are differences in kind. I know a little bit about the subject, as Stu said, back in 2004, I sat down and wrote a book about globalization called The World is Flat. And the simple argument of that book was that right around the year 2000, four things came together to kind of level the global economic playing field. They were first the PC. What the PC allowed was for individuals, individuals, for the first time in the history of the world to create their own content in digital form. Form of bits and bytes. Individuals have been creating their own content in digital form ever since cave men and cave women wrote on cave walls. But with the PC, they could suddenly create their content words, data, photos, spreadsheet, video, music in digital form. Trying to be manipulated in so many more ways and sent so many more places. That happened to coincide with, didn't have to, but it did with the emergence of something called the internet, which allowed me to create my digital content, suddenly send it anywhere in the world virtually for free. And that coincided with the emergence of something called workflow software, which allowed me to collaborate with you on your content, and you with me on my content, wherever we were in the world. And that coincided with the emergence of something called Google, which allowed me to search your content in your mind to vastly enhance our collaboration. The argument of that book was those four things merged together right around the year 2000 and created a platform, a platform, a global platform, on which more people in more places could compete, connect, create, and collaborate on more things for less money with greater efficiency than ever before. Hence, I declared the world is free. Had I been a more honest man, I would have called the book The World is Flattening, um, but it would not have sold actually 4.5 million copies in 42 languages had it been called The World is Flattening, so I was not a more honest man. Uh, but I did it because I also had a sense of where things were going. And I think it's been going on. Because in 2011, I sat down and wrote a new book called That Used to Be Us About America with my friend Michael Mandelbaum. And the first thing I did when I sat down to write this new book called um, That Used to Be Us, How America Lost Its Way and the World It Invented and How We Can't Come Back, was to get the first edition of The World's Flat Back in 2004 off my bookshelf. Just to remind myself what I written. I opened it up to the index in the back. I looked under A, B, C, D, E, F, F, A, C, F, A, C, E, F, A, C, E, B. Facebook wasn't it. Yeah, when I was running around the world in 2004, telling people the world is flat, we're all connected. 
Facebook didn't exist. Twitter was still a sound. The cloud was still in the sky. 4G was a parking place. LinkedIn was a prison. Applications were what you sent to college. Big data was a rap star. And Skype was a typographical error. All of that happened in just the seven years between when I wrote The World's Flood and I wrote my next book in 2011. Friends, something really big happened. We entered the second half of the chess board on globalization. The world went from connected to hyperconnected and from interconnected to interdependent. And once again, I start to see some really funky things. The thing you see most is when the world is this interdependent, your friends can kill you faster than your enemies. So if Greeks don't pay their taxes this year, everyone in this room will be directly or indirectly affected. Wait a minute, Greece is a NATO ally. Greece is our friend. We're actually obligated under the NATO Treaty to protect Greece if somebody attacks Greece. Greece can hurt us today. And the other really funky thing you see is that your rivals falling becomes more dangerous than your rivals rising. If China goes from 8% growth to 1% growth, everyone in this room will feel it personally. If China gets another aircraft carrier, I couldn't care less. Let them give it to me. <laughs> so you get some really weird inversions when the world gets this interdependent. But there is a third force that's entered the second half of the chessboard, and that's Mother Nature. You know, the world's carbon content in our atmosphere has oscillated between 180 parts per million and 280 parts per million for 800,000 years. Since the Industrial Revolution, it's gone from 280 parts per million to over 400 parts per million. That's 100 times faster than the end of the last ice age. And for me, Mother Nature isn't just carbon and global warming. It's also population. See, I'm part of a cohort, a generation, that is the only generation that has ever been able to say this since Adam met Eve. And that is that the population of the world doubled in my lifetime. In 1959, six years after I was born, there were three billion people on the planet. In 1999, there were six billion people on the planet. So Mother Nature has also entered, in her own way, the second half of the chessboard with the same kind of double effect. Now, what are the impacts of this? Well, how does it show up in the real world? You see signs of this all over. Let's start with globalization. I like to travel. I travel a lot for my job, as you said. Whenever I travel, I like to read the local newspapers. I always find interesting things. October 30th, 2010, I'm in New Delhi, reading the Hindu Stand Times. And there's a story on the front page. It's reporting that in Nepal telecommunications firm, has just started providing third generation 3G mobile network service at the summit of Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain. The story says this will allow thousands of climbers and trekkers to throw the region every year access to high speed internet and video calls using their mobile phone. <laughs> Do you realize how many phone calls are being made as we sit here today from the top of Mount Everest? <laughs> that begin, mom will never guess where I'm going. <laughs> That's globalization in the second half of the chessboard. Here's globalization in the second half of the chessboard. I'm in Cairo covering the Arab Spring, the uprising there. There for two weeks, finally get a chance to go home. Go to Cairo Airport. Go into the souvenir shop to buy the missus a little pyramid ashtray to remind her of my time away from home. <laughs> I turn the ashtray over, and what does it say? <laughs> say it with me. Okay. You're a low-wage country. You're in fact the lowest-wage country 
in the whole Eastern Mediterranean. Yet today there's another country, half a world away, that can make your national icon into an ashtray, ship it there, sell it cheaper than you can. That's globalization in the second half of the chess board. How about Moore's Law in the second half of the chess board? Well, I see a lot of examples of this. Last year, a uh, year and a half ago now, I was actually speaking at the New School Summit up in San Francisco. I uh, had rented a Hertz car. And um, I, uh, in the middle of the summit, all my plans changed. I had to change when I turned the car back, where I turned the car back. I thought it was pretty complicated. Called 1 800 Hertz. Got the automated artificially intelligent voice on the line. Um, said, give me your reservation number. I did all that, waited for the voice to tell me, now please remain in the line. A first service representative will be with you shortly. Your call may be recorded for a quality purpose. <laughs> I never got the first representative. I ended up doing the entire interaction, and it was complicated, with artificial intelligence that anticipated every problem. Made a note to tell my girls, girls, you might not want to think about being our great service representative. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Uh, a few months later, I was in Sana, Yemen, um, doing a documentary for Showtime on climate change and the Arab Spring, an amazing project I got to be involved in. Uh, we were looking at Yemen and the water crisis there. Flew from Yemen to Dubai, Dubai to London, Heathrow Airport, got in the in the morning, was in the passport line, bleary eyed. And Completely jet lagged, waiting to go through the passport control. The guy in front of me recognized me, turned around, read the world's flag. We started talking. I did to him what I do to people everywhere I meet. I started interviewing him. What do you do, good sir? He said, I'm in the software business. I said, Software? I love software. What's your software? Oh, he said, Our software is designed to make every lawyer obsolete. <laughs> Neotologic. Um, it's basically TurboTax for the legal profession, um, and it aims to automate about 40% of uh, the work that a typical lawyer does. Uh, in fact, if you go on their website, because uh, they get a lot of flack from lawyers, um, you'll see the lawyers written in and posted a message that, yeah, 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 very interesting, but your software cannot hold hands or wipe away tears. To which Neurologic responded, you will surely see a press release when we can. <laughs> That's the legal profession in the second half of the chessboard. Here's my profession in the second half of the chessboard. I live in Bethesda, Maryland. I occasionally take the, I often take the subway to work. It involves me driving from my house to the Bethesda Hyatt garage. I, I park there and, um, uh, and then take the subway into town. So I, did that one day, a few weeks ago, about a month ago. Parked my car, went downtown, came back, got my car, went to drive out, went to the pavement. Over there's still a person there. It's a rare parking lot. There's still a person there. I gave him my parking thing to pay. And he took my money, looked at me, said, uh, I know you. And I said, that's great. He says, I read your poem. I said, that's great. That's what he says, I don't always agree with you. It's even better. You, know? you have to check. You know? A nice little exchange. I drove off. Week later, same thing. Go in, come back, go to pay, same guy said, during my tension, he says, Mr. Friedman, um, can I talk to you for a second? I said, sure, sir. I have my own blog. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing my own blog. Would you take a look at it? And he writes something. I don't The parking attendant at the Bethesda Metro stop is now my competitor. <laughs> That's my business in the second half of the chess <laughs> We'll talk about that a little bit more later. Here's Mother Nature in the second half of the chessboard. This is one I got to look at very closely. As I mentioned, I took part in this documentary on Showtime last year. I hope some of you got to see it. Here's a living day for free. Um, and I did shows on uh, climate change and in Egypt, Yemen, and Syria. And um, uh, you cannot understand the Syrian revolution unless you understand the Syria experience between 2006 and 2010, the worst drought in its modern history. A million Syrian farmers and herders 
left their homes in northern Syria, precisely Raqqa province, Raqqa province, Raqqa province. Oh, that's where ISIS is headquartered today. We went to Raqqa province before ISIS had taken control. A million Syrian farmers and herders left their homes, flocked to the cities, completely overwhelmed the infrastructure. Assad's government did nothing for them. And they did not start the revolution in Syria. But the second it started, as a woman we interviewed says on the show, with the first call of a loved one, God is great. Every one of these climate refugees could not wait to join this revolution. You cannot understand what happened in Syria unless you understand, as the Times of Israel pointed out, the Syrian revolution started in the two driest spots in the country, Dar and Phoenicia. So, I would believe you can really appreciate what's shaping the world today, unless you understand that these three giant forces, the market, mother nature, and Moore's law, all at the same time, have gone into a kind of hyper growth phase. Now, what is the what are the impacts of this on all of your lives? Well, the first impact, one I know you're familiar with, is a good one, is that this is a great world to be a consumer in. God, you can buy anything, anywhere, for the cheapest price. This is a fantastic world to be a consumer This is a great world to be a maker in. This is a great world to be a maker in. This is a great world to be an entrepreneur, a starter-upper. You can download now the most powerful tools off the web, rent out your kid's spare bedroom on Airbnb, do a little driving for Uber to get your seed capital. God knows this is a fantastic world to be a maker. Unfortunately, it's also a fantastic world to be a breaker in. Because when it's a good world for makers, it's a good world for breakers. As the head of the British National Security Agency said just the other day, Twitter, Facebook, and WhatsApp are the command and control system for ISIS today. When it's a good world for makers, it's a good world for breakers. Because bad guys are always early adults. What else, what are the other implications of this world? One of the big ones I see every day is this is a terrible world to be the leader of anything. <laughs> you do not want to be leading anything in this world. I'm really sorry to tell you that. <laughs> this is a terrible world to lead anything because every leader today of this synagogue, of this country, of China, is in a two-way conversation. The days of top-down, one-way conversations are over. Every leader today, Thad Allen, who led the cleanup of Katrina, told me this former Coast Guard coming down. He said to lead something today, every leader today involves a co-production. Co-production. The idea of just ordering things top-down is completely over. You don't want to leave anything. And that's a little bit what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now. You see, I spoke earlier about what will future historians think. What do you think future archaeologists will think? A thousand years from now, when they dig up Washington, D.C., circa 2010, they dig through all these layers, and then they hit this layer, and they're going to say to themselves, go figure, the second most powerful man in Washington, arguably the second most powerful man in the world, the chief of staff of the president of the United States, voluntarily gave up his job to run for, not yet run for, mayor of a Midwestern town. Oh, Chicago, and I'm talking about Ronald McDonald. Oh, these archaeologists will say, did the advisor of Caesar 
ever voluntarily resigned to run for mayor of Carthage? <laughs> What's that about? What that's about is in the second half of the chessboard, it's not so much fun to be the most, second most powerful man in America. And I just did a Freudian slip. It's not so much fun to be the most powerful man in America. If you watched the president's press conference yesterday. And one of the reasons for this is our country has very quietly, and I think dangerously, been moving from a representative democracy to a popular democracy. See, our founding fathers believed in representative democracy. They thought the will of the people should be filtered through elected representatives. And they had a very limited idea what those should be. It should be white, land-owning males. Fortunately, we have expanded that. But what's happened in the second half of the chessboard, in the age of Twitter and Facebook, is you've got half the representatives of Congress walking around just chasing their Twitter feed. There they go. I must catch up for I am their leader. Our Congress today is so much more like American Idol than it is the Constitution of Congress. It is really, really troubling. You don't want to leave anything. One upside of the second half of the chessboard, though, something that is actually good news for us, is that the return on investment on pluralism in the second half of the chessboard soars, grows exponentially. What do I mean? I mean, if you have a pluralistic society that also has pluralism, I'm talking about the United States of America, you have such an advantage for both social stability and for innovation because you can draw in the best minds of the world and constantly replenish them. You see, if you want to know what's going on in Syria and Iraq today, I can give you it in 30 seconds. Basically, this is a pluralistic region. Shiites, Kurds, Sunnis, Druze, Christians, Turkmen, Yazidis, Ismailis. This is a pluralistic region that never mastered pluralism. So its pluralistic character, its multi-ethnic character, was always managed horizontally by iron fists from the top down. First, they were called the Ottoman Turks for 500 years. Then it was the British and French, Iron Fist. Then it was kings and dictators. What's happening today? No more Ottoman Turks. No more British and French. And fewer, fewer kings and dictators. So the pluralistic character of this region can no longer be managed vertically from the top down. It can only be managed horizontally by the constituent communities forging social contracts for how to live together I should have been vertically, horizontally, as equal citizens. So you're seeing an entire region go from vertical control, top down, to horizontal control. Now you can do that in one of three ways. One is if you have a Mandela. Turns out there is only one of those, and he was in South Africa. The other way you go from vertical control to horizontal is if you have a military. We thought that was going to happen in Egypt. Didn't work out so Third way you go from vertical to horizontal is if you have a midwife. That was the role we tried to play rather inaptly in Iraq and Afghanistan. If you have no Mandela, no midwife, and no military, and you have a pluralistic region that lacks pluralism, you have Iraq and Syria. That's what's going on. The fact that we have a country as a country in a time when top-down control is disappearing everywhere, have mastered pluralism. Oh, and we are a work in progress. We're a work in progress every day when you only need to look at Ferguson, Missouri to know that. But we are so much farther along than anybody else in the second half of the chessboard. This is a huge advantage. Never forget, we have twice elected a black man whose middle name is Hussein, whose grandfather was a Muslim who defeated a woman to run against a Mormon. <laughs> who, who does that? Okay. Uh, who, who does that? 
I'm 61 and I'm in good health. I was just at the Cleveland Clinic, my cholesterol is 130. Fantastic. But I will not live long enough to see a Moroccan president of France. And I will not live long enough to see a Pakistani Prime Minister of India. So the fact that we have mastered pluralism in the second half of the chessboard and top down vertical control is not going to be so available anymore, huge advantage. Now let me come to the two core closest issues to home. One is that in the second half of the chessboard, the most important geopolitical fact is that average is over for every country. And the most important socioeconomic fact is that average is over for every American worker. And that's a lot of what is roiled in the world. Let me do the countries first, and I'll do it quickly. Basically, see, during the Cold War, you could be average as a country. You could be average. Why? Because the world was a chessboard, and every square was either red or red, white, and blue. And the Soviet Union and America were competing over every square. So they would send you foreign They'd build your state or government house. They'd educate your kids at the Trees Lamont University in Moscow for free. And if you were Egypt and Syria, you could lose two wars to Israel, get completely wiped out, and they'd rebuild your army. And it was a world of walls, so you were protected, so there wasn't a country called China that could make your national icon into an ashtray. <laughs> Where are we today in the second half of the chessboard? No more walls of protection and no more superpower competition. And under the pressure of the market, Mother Nature, and Moore's Law, all Dublin, strong countries are being stressed. That's what our election was about yesterday. And weak countries are blowing up. And that's what you see. Libya, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Mali, Chad, these countries are literally blowing up under the pressures of the second half of the chessboard. And that's why the big divide in the world today is no longer east-west, north-south, communist capitalist. The big divide in the world today is now between the world of order and the world of disorder. That's the big divide in the second half of the chessboard. And the world of order is built on two pillars, either top-down order, we still got some of that, Russia, China, but the price of maintaining top-down order goes up every day. Look at Hong Kong. You've got to arrest more people, kill more people, send some more media. Or you have consensual order. Thank God that's what we've got built from the bottom up. But the rest is in real danger of slipping into disorder. That's what happens when average is over for countries in the second half of the chessboard. 